All right, I am back once again, and once again I have one of my Nikon rangefinders, the Nikon S3, as you've probably seen before, and I have yet another 35mm lens. I've gotten a little bit carried away with the 35mm lenses, but that's one of my favorite focal lengths, and uh, there's... Uh, Nikon made quite a few different models, and there's actually a decent number of generic third-party models in the Nikon S mount, so I've, I've, I've accumulated several of them over the last uh, couple of years. And this is one I haven't had for quite as long. This is a very early Nikon 35mm f3.5, and uh, this one is quite interesting. I almost didn't buy it. I'd, I'd seen this lens, and I kind of like the design. It's got an interesting kind of a low-profile design, and it has this aperture ring that's sort of built into the front of the camera instead of around the edge which is not the most convenient thing to use, but it does look pretty cool. But I found this one at a pretty reasonable price, and I know I say that about everything, but it has a pretty neat little hidden secret. If you look in there, I don't know if you're going to be able to see it too well on camera, you can kind of see it says made in occupied Japan, which is pretty rare. Um, Nikon stuff wasn't made with that marking for very long, so I don't know the exact numbers, but I've heard it's possible that only four to 700 lenses uh, in this range, 35 millimeter were made with that uh, marking. I don't know for sure if that's true. Uh, I've seen conflicting sources online, and there there aren't too many sources, and uh, I I don't know if it really matters. It's pretty rare. I haven't seen many of these, and I just kind of liked it. Price point seemed good, so I went ahead and bought it. Uh, and I've I've shot it recently. I've shot it a few times. I've shot it on the SP once or twice, I want to say, and more recently I've shot it on this S3 a few times. Uh, because it has the 35mm frame lines built into the primary finder, so it's a pretty convenient lens to use in a lot of ways because you don't need an external finder uh, because the external finders can cost almost as, almost as much as the lens. It's um, kind of a shame and kind of strange too, but uh, it's it's a pretty nice lens, I gotta say. I wasn't expecting a whole lot from it. I've heard people say online these are not particularly sharp lenses or that they um, they just don't have the best image quality, the best IQ, as some people say. I don't really like that term, but um, some people say they're a little, uh, they have a very vintage look that they just don't hold up very well compared to later models, but I kind of like that more vintage look, so I, I, I wasn't really expecting a whole lot when I bought this lens, but so far I've been pretty impressed. Um, it gets a really nice depth of field when wide open around f3.5 or f, even f4. I think there were images I got that were somewhere around f5.6 or kind of right in between 5.6 and 4. They got a very handsome depth of field uh, with a very, very nice smooth bokeh, kind of similar to the uh, the Kimura lens. Um, it's a pretty sharp lens. I would say its sharpness is more or less on par with the 35mm uh, f2.5, the later model. Um, it's always kind of hard to say because I mean I'm shooting these lenses kind of as is on vintage cameras manually focusing them and then trying to scan film and I have a Canon scanner it is a Canon uh, I think it's a Canoscan 9000 F Mark II you gotta love how Canon always goes with a number and then a Mark III behind that number but um, it's not the best scanner it's not bad but it doesn't always have the best results so it's often kind of hard to really speak too much on sharpness. And I know, too, I don't have perfect eyesight, so even the stuff that I think is in focus can be a little bit off. Uh, but I would have to say the sharpness, all in all, is pretty comparable to the later lenses, the uh, 35 f2.5. And um, probably from what I saw, not, not quite as good as that Kimura lens I tried out more recently. But I think that was a somewhat later lens design, because this lens would have probably come out in the probably the late 40s, especially with the Made in Occupied Japan marking on it maybe the very early 50s, uh, but this would have been one of the first offerings Nikon made for a wide-angle lens, and I know nowadays most people don't think 35 is a wide-angle lens, but back in the day anything wider than 50 was considered wide-angle. So this was the original Nikon wide-angle lens, as unimpressive as its stats might be, a 35mm f3.5, but I gotta say, I, I like it. It's got a very nice character, um, reasonably sharp results, especially for the time period. Uh, I say that, I, I always talk about sharpness, and I feel like that's kind of a double-edged sword, uh, figuratively speaking. Um, no pun intended, I guess I should say. But um, it's, it's always tough because you want to compare them to something else, but it's hard to say what, because I compare these old Nikon lenses from like the 50s to much later lenses made by like Canon in the 80s or Pentax in the 70s or 80s. Uh, Nikon stuff that was made in the 80s or 90s a lot of times, so there's a big difference in time, and it might not seem like a lot, but lens sharpness improved pretty notably uh, in that span of time. And it's also really tempting to just look and compare to uh, modern-day high-end uh, digital cameras with auto-focusing lenses and really high megapixel counts and be like, well, this lens isn't very sharp in comparison to that high-end Nikon D4 with a 
35 millimeter f 1.8 lens than a G series or whatever. And uh, I think that's kind of a foolish thing to do because, of course, the, the newer lens is going to be way sharper. The autofocus alone would give you much more consistent results and probably just probably just better general sharpness than the naked eye and using these old range finders and manually focusing because you are going to have errors. You're going to uh, one thing I do is I focus a lot of times and your, uh, your little rangefinder patch is right in the middle of the frame and I kind of focus with that but then I don't want to shoot something directly straight on where everything's perfectly centered so I kind of turn the camera just a little bit to get kind of a rule of thirds thing going and I think in some cases that might be enough to just throw off the focus by a tiny tiny bit. I know some people will say well it shouldn't really matter that much if you're shooting wide or open and yeah it probably shouldn't but if you're shooting really um, well I mean if you're shooting more closed down if you're shooting wide open at like f1.8 like with the other 35 millimeter lens I have that came with the SP I think it can make a little bit of a difference. It's not going to ruin the image but I think it can just generally speaking reduce sharpness because especially if you're doing something like an environmental portrait and you focus in on somebody in the, the center of the frame and you get them a nice sharp focus and then you kind of turn it to get that 35 or I mean that um, rule of thirds type thing going on I think that can be enough to throw the focus a little bit and you also have to remember that the center part uh, which is in focus is probably going to just be kind of aimed at nothing it's going to be just kind of hanging there in midair so it's not going to look perfect and I, that, that's something I tend to say a lot and I, I think I kind of needed to clarify that I don't know if I really did but you know uh, I think for its time it is a pretty sharp lens, probably not the sharpest, I'm sure at the same time there was uh, probably Zeiss lenses that were a lot sharper. From what I have seen this is very comparable to a lot of the Leica lenses because Leica was not very good at making uh, wide angle lenses at this time frame. They did make a 35, I think it was pretty slow, it, it might have been a 3.5 as well but I don't quite remember and I know they made a 28 for a while that was uh, like an f5.6. And I don't think those were generally noted as being very sharp lenses or having amazing image quality. So I think this is uh, probably on par with most of the other stuff that was coming out around that time frame with maybe the exception of some high-end Carl Zeiss stuff. Um, but all in all, I have to say, it's got a very nice uh, look to it. It's, it's nothing miraculous, but it does have a very nice vintage look. Um, you can, Like I said, you can pull a lot of depth of field out of it. It's got a very nice bouquet, reasonably sharp when in focus. Um, the one thing I did notice is sometimes when I was shooting off in the distance around the infinity focus, some of the images just weren't super sharp and I think again that was just me not really um, having perfect focus because uh, it's tempting when you see something off in the distance just to immediately flip it to um, the infinity focus and a lot of times that's good enough but it's not always perfect because especially if something is, because um, your, your little uh, scale right here is kind of vague, it goes from 50 feet to infinity which is um, a pretty big difference. So I mean is, is right in between 50 and infinity, is that 100 feet? Is that 200 feet? Uh, you don't really know. They don't mark it and I, I imagine it's probably less than 100 feet but I really don't know for sure. I haven't seen a lot of literature on exactly how to calculate that. I've tried to look for it and uh, it doesn't really seem to exist anymore. I'm sure at some point somebody had all that stuff kind of figured out but I, I just don't really have it. I've seen it for telephoto lenses like the 50 and 85 but not for the wider angle lenses which I would like to see. So if anybody has that, could you please post a link in the comments. Um, one thing about this lens that's kind of interesting is the ergonomics. It's very different from other lenses because um, I've noted the uh, other Nikon lenses have the aperture ring right around the nose and this one does, but where you can usually kind of manipulate it like that, with this one you have this, um, this little kind of uh, ring of grippy stuff. I don't really know what you call it. It's just kind of a textured metal ring and all your uh, little numbers are right on the inside, kind of like some of the other lenses, but it is an odd feel because it, it doesn't click into place on any of the aperture numbers. It just slides very freely and you have this um, this kind of ring right up here that's it's just different from the other ones. I wouldn't say it's really worse or better. In some ways it's a little easier to turn because it's not clicked and it does have this extra grip right here. Uh, but a downside I found is if you just kind of toss in your camera bag and pull it out and you had it set at like f5.6, it's almost certainly going to be thrown all the way to f16 or f3.5 or uh, you know something like that's probably going to happen which can be a little bit of an annoyance if you're outside and you, you know you just kind of want to shoot around like f5.6 or f8 and you know that's you'll pretty consistently shoot in that range and it should be okay and then suddenly it's at 3.5 and you're like oops I think I fired off a couple of shots and I bet those aren't going to look great but um, just something you have to be aware of. I guess that's kind of true with a lot of this vintage gear. You have to be much more aware of it than digital stuff. There's not a lot of flashing lights to show you something's wrong. There's not a lot of reminders. Things aren't always uh, 
you know, right there in the viewfinder on a screen where you can easily reference them. You got to look around a little more and be a little bit more aware of what you're doing, which is something I kind of like about these cameras, but I'm sure some people will find that very frustrating, especially if you're a new user who comes over from digital and you start shooting film. But um, yeah, I've got to say, this is not a bad lens. Uh, it stacks up to all the other ones. I don't know if I'd say if it's better or worse. It has a slightly different feel. Um, strangely, even though it's got the uh, the minimum aperture isn't quite as fast. I think it does have a slightly more notable and dramatic depth of field than the f2.5 variation. Um, I know a lot of people will say, well, how do you really get a depth of field out of a 35 f3.5? Uh, and I would say you get close. You get as close as you can into that minimum focusing distance, and you can do portraits and stuff and have a pretty darn nice uh, depth of field. And I'll include some images I took to uh, kind of prove that. But uh, again, I have to say I was impressed by this lens, and I think in some regards it has more character than the 35 f2.5. Uh, Sharpness-wise, it's really hard to say. I think they're pretty comparable to one another. Um, I had some more 35 f2.5 images developed on color film, and they were a little bit sharper than my black and white ones, which kind of lends credence to what I said before, that maybe my scanner is not the best. I don't really have a good uh, professionally developed color images I've shot on this lens yet. Or I, I think I took some, but I just haven't gotten them developed yet. But I do have quite a bit of images that were shot on black and white. I, sh I took this out to a Vietnam War reenactment and I got some really cool photos because I figure the, um, this would have been something that would have been available in that period. I don't know how common it would have been during the Vietnam War. Early on people might have been shooting um, Nikon range finders and lenses, but I, I don't really know. I know. I've heard Nikonis cameras were pretty popular in the uh, Vietnam War because they were very durable and waterproof, but I'm going on to a whole crazy rabbit hole there that needs to be another video. So. Um, I guess in the end, uh, the big question is which which lens should you buy, or I guess should you buy this lens, or if you're looking for a 35, should you buy this one, should you buy the uh, 35 f 2.5, and it's one of those things where as always it's very subjective. Um, for a while I thought these lenses were pretty cheap, but I've been looking around and I, I got a decent deal on this one, but it seems like in general they cost as much or more than the 35 f 2.5s that came later. And there's also a 35 f 3.5 that has more of the, the straight barrel and the later style um, aperture ring. And it also, I think it closes down to f 22 instead of f 16 like this one. Those are about the same price as the 35 f 2.5. Maybe a little bit cheaper, but not by a huge margin. These though, from what I've seen, usually cost as much or more as the 35 f 2.5s and the later model f 3.5s. I'm not exactly sure why. I guess it's rarity. Um, I mean, that's really the only thing I could think of. Maybe there's certain people out there who just know they have interesting image characteristics and really like them and are willing to spend more on them. But I think most of it is just purely down to the rarity, the fact that these were only produced for a couple of years as far as I can tell. And um, I think they were probably kind of expensive back in the day, so they probably weren't huge sellers. So I'm guessing that's what led to the rarity, but I, I don't really know. I haven't seen a whole lot of sources talking about this particular lens. I looked up, there's a pretty extensive article on them on the uh, Mirror camera website, but it doesn't really give much about production numbers or sales. But uh, all in all, I, I think this is a nice lens, and if you find one, it's, um, it's probably worth I mean, if you like wide-angle lenses, I'd say it's definitely worth picking up. If it's like a very expensive lens, it's not really much better than the other 35 millimeter lenses. It's very comparable to them in most ways. Um, it is different, but it, let's say you already have a 35 f 2.5 or the later model 35 f 3.5, you don't really need to pick one of these up. Um, I got this one, like I said, I, I really had no intent of buying this lens. I bought it just because it had the little Made in Occupied Japan stamp. I thought that was really cool and I'd never seen that before. Uh, well, I'd never seen it before in a lens I could afford, and this was a, a pretty reasonably priced lens just for this class of lens, not taking into account the fact that it said made in occupied Japan. Um, so all in all, it's something I kind of like. This is something I would definitely want to hold on to, uh, but for the average shooter, I think it might probably be a little bit more reasonable to go with a later model lens because they are a lot more common and they're generally a little bit cheaper, which again, I don't really understand why, but that's how things are. So, um, yeah, that's just kind of my two cents on the uh, 35 f 3.5. And I have to say, I really enjoyed shooting this lens, and I think I'm going to actually make this one of my primary lenses. I've got so many 35s, I have more I'm going to also do reviews on because I've covered the, uh, the f 2.5 and this one right here, the f 3.5, but I have the f 1.8 version that came with my special edition 2005 SP. I'll cover that at some point. I have a decent number of sample images, but I just haven't gotten around to it.
Uh, I did the Camora lens. I also have a Voigtlander, um, Voigtlander, I think it's the Scopar lens in Nikon S mount, which is a 35 f2.5. And those are a lot more modern. They're not especially rare, uh, but they're they're out there. I've had that lens for a little while, and I've shot with it intermittently, but I don't have a ton of sample images. Uh, but I'll definitely do reviews on those lenses later on, and at some point I think I'll compare all the lenses to one another uh, on some arbitrary standard I'll have to make up later. So stay tuned for all that, and uh, stay tuned. I'll show you a few images of uh, how this image is taken with this lens so you can get an idea of how it actually works in the field.